Hello, said Alice. You're listening to Red Herring, a Batwoman podcast. I'm Erin. And I'm Shelley. And we are here to get curiouser and curiouser about the latest episode of Batwoman. If you know us from our Supergirl podcast, Pod Off Course, you know that we like to delve into these episodes from a queer perspective, and we fully intend to keep doing that here, especially with all the quality queer content that Batwoman seems to be ready to give us. So much queer content. Love it. A lot. <laughs> um, this episode was Batwoman's very first standalone episode. We saw Kate Kane before in the Elseworlds crossover um, between Supergirl, The Flash, and Arrow. But this is the first episode of Batwoman as its own show. And the press release for the episode is as follows. Uh, Kate Kane never planned to be Gotham's new vigilante. Gotham is a city in despair. The Gotham City Police Department have been overrun and outgunned by criminal gangs. Enter Jacob Kane and his military-grade Crow's private security, which now protects the city with omnipresent firepower and militia. Years before, Jacob's first wife and daughter were killed in the crossfire of Gotham crime. He sent his only surviving daughter, Kate Kane, away from Gotham for her safety. After a dishonorable discharge from military school and years of brutal survival training, Kate returns home when the Alice in Wonderland gang targets her father and his security firm by kidnapping his best crow officer and Kate's ex-girlfriend, Sophie Moore. Although remarried to wealthy socialite Catherine Hamilton Kane, who bankrolls the crows, Jacob is still struggling with the family he lost while keeping Kate, the daughter he still has, at a distance. But Kate is a woman who's done asking for permission. In order to help her family and her city, she'll have to become the thing her father loathes, a vigilante. With the help of her compassionate stepsister Mary and the crafty Luke Fox, the son of Wayne uh, Enterprises tech guru Lucius Fox, Kate Kane continues the legacy of her missing cousin Bruce Wayne as Batwoman. Still holding a flame for Sophie, Kate uses everything in her power to combat the dark machinations of the psychotic Alice, who's always somewhere slipping between sane and insane. Armed with a passion for social justice and a flair for speaking her mind, Kate soars through the shadowed streets of Gotham as Batwoman. So that's the whole episode. <laughs> right, they pretty well summed it up for us. That's Thanks everything. for joining us. See you yeah. next week. <laughs> <laughs> so, I say we go ahead and just dive in with Kate Kane. Kate Kane, played by Ruby Rose. The only one that we have seen before. And I'm just going to like throw it out there right off the bat. I don't give a fuck what people say on the internet. And I feel like most of the people saying it were men. Mm -hmm. I think she did an awesome job. I was super impressed with her stunt skills and the fighting scenes. That survival scene right off the bat where she's like underwater busting through the ice. That was fucking amazing. Yeah, I am uh, not here to criticize her acting at all which people really want to do i don't know like i i just like stumble onto things on twitter and i'm always like super shocked by it because it just seems so just out there like i just i thought she did a really great job i was super impressed by this episode yeah i think in a lot of ways people are just by people i mean probably straight white men are mad about batwoman existing <laughs> as a tv show and yeah, I'm I'm just excited about it, and I think Ruby Rose did a great job. So that's how I feel. I think she did great, especially with the stunts and stuff. And I think um, I went back and watched Elseworlds, and I think that she has grown as an actor now, leading her own show. So um, I'm not worried about it. Yeah, no, I'm not either. So Kate is a lesbian, and she's, she's very out and. She was kicked out of West Point because of it. Um, I don't think they specified it by name here, but it was don't ask, don't tell. And her girlfriend, Sophie, broke up with her so she could stay at West Point. She told Kate she didn't love her, and it seemed like it crushed her when she told her that. Um, yeah, they were uh, caught kissing and basically both asked to denounce 
that that had ever happened, and they had to sign a form that said that they had no homosexual activity going on, and Kate was like, I'm not doing this. And Sophie was like, I already did it. Yeah, it was sad. It was really sad to watch. I don't know, I feel like I've experienced things similar to that, and it's just really hard to deal with. Yeah, and I totally see where both of them are coming from. Yeah, um, no, I Sophie I had a whole future and career and life ahead of her, so it's hard to to give that up. So, yeah, that part was sad. <laughs> yeah, it seems like Kate has had a pretty tough life. She lost her mother and her sister when she was young. She was in the car accident that they were both in. I don't know why at the time I didn't realize it was, like, gang-related. I don't know if I missed that, if that was, like, on one of the newspaper articles. I didn't either. I just thought it was a an accident. But I guess they did say that, like, 34 other kids were saved that day, so there must have been some big crime going on. Well, that was, like, I just figured they were on the bus. It was a school bus that, like, rear-ended them, right? Yeah, I guess was the bus hanging off the bridge on the other end or something? I think so. I was just focusing on the car. So I guess it was high crime related. But that's different than what happened in the comic book. Like in the comics, they were kidnapped by a terrorist group. And Kate's dad, Jacob, led a rescue mission because he was like a colonel in the military. And Kate's mom was killed in the fight. And she thought that her sister Beth was also killed in the fight. Because she sees a child's body covered with a blanket, but it turns out it's another girl they kidnapped, and they kept Beth. The terrorists kept her, and Jacob knows that, and he knows that the terrorists still have her, and he looked for her for years, but he never found her, and he never told Kate that Beth was still alive. Interesting. Okay, we'll talk about that more later when we talk about Beth. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's how in the comics, like, all that went down. Like, it was the same thing. Like, she still lost her mom and her sister. It was just different means. Okay. That's so, cool. Yeah. And the whole West Point thing is in the comics. I don't even know if they called it West Point in the TV show. I just assume because that's... I don't think they did. They just called it the Academy. Okay. But in the comics, it was, it was West Point. And Kate figures out Bruce Wayne's secret that he's Batman... Mm-hmm. I feel like that was really like a really awesome exchange between her and Luke Fox. And Luke Fox is Batwing in the comics. I don't know if he's going to play that role in this TV show. I hope he does. I like him. Yeah, he's all like into martial arts and stuff like that. And he had a relationship with Barbara Gordon, a.k.a. Batgirl. So... We'll see. In the new DC Rebirth series, he's recruited to a team that Batman and Batwoman set up. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with his character instead of being like a scared employee who fucked up and like blew Bruce Wayne's secret identity Mm -hmm. and let somebody in the Batcave, et cetera, et cetera. (laughs) So (laughs) it'll be it'll be interesting to see what they do they use him for i hope it's more than just that yeah that scene i thought was really funny though where she says uh i don't know if she said it was my cousin but she said someone told me that you should grow up to be the person you needed when you were younger and the person i needed knew how to do this and she broke out of her handcuffs and dodged a punch and handcuffed him to the wall that was (laughs) so cool yeah (laughs) Um, yeah i i love that and i i like luke a lot Hopefully he can have a little bit of a bigger role moving forward. Yeah, I like that she asked him if the password was still Alfred. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed Alfred a great deal, so I'm, I'm glad they gave him a nod. So this presumably is taking place before Elseworlds, because she's already Batwoman in Elseworlds. And in Elseworlds, when she's talking to Barry and Oliver and Kara, she gives them the plans of the building, and she's like, you know, if this helps you or whatever. Um and Oliver's like, I don't see how this would help me, because he didn't know that Bruce Wayne was Batman. But when as she's walking away, she's like, oh, and by the way, the password's Alfred. So she does not change it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's funny. Hopefully that becomes a running joke. Then we have Kate's stepsister, Mary, who seems a little bit flighty, but it turns out is a doctor. Yeah, I thought they were setting up 
setting her up to be like annoying and like a pain. She was introduced as girl who talks too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, over the it, phone it, when Kate was in her secret crows training. And it turns out she runs an amazing illegal street clinic that's like helping people out who might not get help otherwise. Yeah, so and she was... keeps saying it's like courtesy of Gotham City a medical school or something. So like I don't know if she stole everything. <laughs> Sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because um, she said she's like, I don't know, she made a Robin Hood reference, like mm-hmm. take from the rich to give to the poor, essentially. So yeah, she said she's the something of Short Road Forest, and that was another. There's another reference. Yeah. But, yeah, she's cool. I like her a lot, which is good, because I thought we were supposed to not like her, and I'm glad that we are allowed to. (laughs) Yeah. Her mom seems very worried about her image, so it's Kate's stepmom. I didn't catch her name. Her name is Catherine. Okay. And she seems like some sort of influencer slash, I don't know, high society person who just has a network of really rich, powerful people. Because she's rich. Yeah, she's definitely rich. And she's, like, all about, like, photo ops and creating an image. And that's why she wanted, like, Kate to show up where she showed up at the same time and, like, stuff like that. Kate is also Jewish, which is awesome. And in one of the holiday comics that DC put out, she and... Uh, her girlfriend at the time, which I believe was Maggie Sawyer, um, was yeah, celebrating Hanukkah. So I think it's really cool that she's all these things that you don't typically get to see represented in comic books. Mm-hmm. She's groundbreaking in a lot of ways, and she's also hard to describe. <laughs> um, like, she's the first lesbian lead character or the first lesbian titular character of a show a superhero show that i can think of i don't know is she the first jewish superhero i thought i mean i think there's a lot of themes in terms of that in superman there's professor stein right and felicity oh yeah felicity's jewish isn't she that's all i can think of off the top of my head Yeah, so in terms of, like, a lead character, she's the first one with a lot of these identities that I can think of, which is really cool. At the same time, I see a lot of articles calling her the first gay superhero, which, like, there's a lot of them (laughs) already exist. Um, Anissa Pierce from Black Lightning is a lesbian and very close to the lead of her own show, um... There's Sarah Lance. There's yeah. <laughs> Ava Sharp. There's Curtis from Arrow. There's Nissa Algul. Nissa Algul. And if Batwoman counts as a superhero, and she's she does not have superpowers, she just has resources. So if we're using that as a definition, then Alex Danvers counts. Yes. Um. So there's she's not the first gay superhero. <laughs> um, yeah. The Ray. In, in the slightest. Yeah. The Ray. Um. Leonard, Leonard Snart. Yeah. From Earth X, Leonard mm-hmm. Snart. There are tons. Yeah. Um, we all know Cardan versus Mary Delina Luther. <laughs> yes. That uh, is fact. So really <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um <laughs> so yeah, it's it's hard to like explicitly define exactly what she is and you know, what she is and is not the first of. Um, but what I what I think is important is that she is definitely groundbreaking as a character the intersection of all of her identity is the fact that she is the title character the fact that this is her own show um that's all big stuff so i'm excited yeah. about that and the first uh lesbian kiss came in at under the eight minute mark so yeah having a show it's pretty awesome having a show with a lesbian character where they are just that's just what they are from the beginning yeah is awesome. That's amazing. And I, in some ways, Sarah Lance, at least in the iteration where she had come back in season two of Arrow, and she was a new actress, Katie Lotz was not the first Sarah Lance. She was bisexual from the get-go, but it wasn't in the eighth minute of her being around. Um, right. So, like, that was cool. 
it's good that it, it doesn't have to be a big deal. She just was kissing a cute girl on the side of a shed. And it was what it is. And it was dope. Like, she already knows who she is. There's no, like, questioning in her mind. It's just what's up. And it's kind of refreshing mm-hmm. to see that as, like, it's not a big deal that that she's coming out or that she fell in love with a woman or it's just there and it's just fact. It's just what is. And that's, that makes it really, really awesome to watch. Yeah. That was something that I have not seen before. (laughs) Yeah. So that was awesome. I remember thinking that explicitly when I saw it, I was like, this is so cool. (laughs) So that's very exciting. And I think she and Sophie were really, really cute together. Yeah, me too. And I'm kind of sad about it all. Um, Spoiler alert, Sophie's now married to a man. And Kate seemed to handle it really well. Sophie seemed really awkward about it. Yeah, she did seem really awkward about it. And so did her husband. Like, they just did. (laughs) They seemed very awkward together. Kate did seem really cool about it. She was just like, oh, you're married. Congratulations. Which had a big smile on her face the entire time. Like, yeah, didn't which falter at all. Makes total sense because like bisexuality is a real and cool thing, and if you're right. not with someone for a while, it makes sense that they might be with someone else by the next time you meet them. <laughs> um, right. And so I thought she handled it very well, but yeah, the whole like <laughs> I don't know what's going on with Sophie and her husband, but they didn't seem super thrilled to be married. <laughs> Or at least Sophie didn't. I mean, he did make the comment that he'd have to, like, keep an eye on her. So she didn't yeah. disappear again or whatever. But, like... He seems like he's in love with her, but she... I don't know if she just felt bad that she didn't tell Kate or something. Right. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm chalking this up to maybe, like, military training, which it seems obvious that they all had... If my wife had been missing for a couple days by a psycho woman who just killed, like, at least two people, maybe more, I'd be beside myself. And he seemed You would have taken an earlier flight? (laughs) Yeah, he seemed pretty put together. So, it just, yeah. I don't know. I also, I don't know if they're going to do that thing that they did in The Flash with Iris and Eddie, where they just kill him. (laughs) Oh, I didn't think about that. That was sad. I mean, I, I really like that. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I don't want to drop down that rabbit hole, but yeah, that was a good, that was a good death. Mm-hmm. In a way that, like, I mean, he sacrificed himself. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> For those who didn't watch <laughs> The Flash in 2014 when it came out. Yeah. <laughs> that's on um, you, I think, at this point. Yeah, that's a, that sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> I gotta go back and watch season one of The Flash. That The Flash is good. It is uh, good. But Batwoman's really good, too. And that's oh, what right. we're, is that what we're about doing today. about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I guess while we're talking about Kate and Sophie, Kate ultimately saves Sophie as Batwoman. And Sophie clearly knows that Batwoman is a woman and not Batman. But she doesn't know that she's Kate. And she doesn't tell anyone that Batwoman isn't Batman. So that's going to be fun. Yeah. I mean, I get it, like, a little bit, sort of. But it was, like, weird how Batwoman had her thumb in Sophie's mouth (laughs) for, like, a second. That was just, like, I get it, like, because Kate and, like, knows Sophie and their history. And she didn't know she was married Um, at that point. Like, I guess she just got carried away. (laughs) But it's Usually, just... when I save someone from falling off a building, <laughs> I like to make it really intimate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't, I don't know about somebody putting their finger in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, oh, I'm in a new type of danger. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> why is the stranger putting their thumb in my mouth? <laughs> And she was, like, fully hugging her, too, which could have been explained by the fact that they fell onto the bed, which is the biggest fan fiction trope I've ever seen. Truth. That just wrote itself. Right. So, like, that part makes sense, but not when you add the thumb. (laughs) Yeah, that's just... 
I mean, like maybe like brush your thumb along her cheek. But right. Like, that was just awkward to me. Like that just made me feel like, I mean, you guys are just on that roof. Like everybody's hands are dirty. Um, I know, like nobody <laughs> thinks of that. Hands are dirty. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like just where my mind was. Like you just touch that knife. That what's her face like? Yeah. I don't know. Like there's just so many things. It kind of seemed like she <laughs> forgot that she was in costume. Yeah. She says, like, oh, it's not you. And then that's when she realizes that she, or like, oh, you're not him. I don't remember exactly what she said. And then she got up and tried to leave, and then the door was locked. I thought that was funny. Yeah, that's um, something that would totally happen to me. Yeah, she just, like, smiled and unlocked the door and left, <laughs> which was really funny. Um, But, yeah, that's that scene was weird to me. Okay, so Jacob Kane is Kate Kane's dad. He is Beth Kane's dad, who Beth and Kate's mom and Jacob's wife died in that car accident. He is also the head of the Crows, which I guess is Gotham's police force, kind of. It's like a private security force, basically, that he made to pick up the slack after Batman skipped town, is how they described it. He's also Martha Wayne's brother. Okay. So Bruce's mom's brother. Yeah. Hence the cousins. Yeah. Cool. And he loves Sophie, not romantically, but as a daughter. Sophie is a crow and he clearly has affection for her, but he pushed Kate away ever since her mom and sister died and Kate was allegedly in training to be a crow, but Kate sort of knew that her dad was never going to actually let her be one. And so they sort of have a confrontation about that. Um, And it's clear that they haven't seen each other for a while because he says something about like, oh, neck tattoo, that's new. So they seem to be estranged. And Kate later accuses him of uh, doing that on purpose because she reminds him of everything that he lost. Yeah. And I mean, he seems like a good guy with good intentions. But he also seems like somebody who's very frustrating for Kate at times. Yeah, because at the same time that, you know, he's reminding Kate of everything that happened, like, Kate also lost her mom and her sister. So if her dad's not accepting her anymore, she doesn't have anybody left. So a little of a bad move on his part. (laughs) Right. I don't know. Like, I feel like he's trying to do, like, the, the right thing by starting, like, the security company and he like wants to keep his daughter safe because he's already lost so much. Yeah, he doesn't that's why he wanna... won't make her a crow. Yeah, he doesn't want to lose her too. And I get that, but it's just I think he needs to see how it's affecting her as well. And hopefully, like maybe he'll come around a little bit to that because it's it's having like a really negative effect on her. And I I mean, even though she's a very aloof kind of person like I feel like it's probably like affecting her self-worth to an extent so it'll be interesting to see how their relationship plays out throughout the season yeah it will and there doesn't seem to be that much about him not accepting her just as like who she is and you know her sexuality and stuff like that like it doesn't seem to be that at least right now it just seems like he just doesn't know how to handle her (laughs) in terms of how to treat her as his daughter and grapple with everything he's lost and everything like that. It just seems like he's doing stupid things, but with good intentions. Right. It, it kind of sounds like they're a lot alike. Mm-hmm. And that maybe is like what's scaring him. Yeah, somewhat. I think so too. Part of me feels like we're not supposed to like him, but at the same time, I don't really have a reason not to at this point. Right. Like, I don't, I feel like he's just trying to, be a good dad in, like, a really complicated situation. Maybe, like, a uh, Moira Queen. <laughs> um, maybe a little better. Yeah, I mean, she sort of contributed to the deaths of, like, hundreds of people. <laughs> True. <laughs> so there's that. Okay, so those are most of the characters, except for our big bad, Alice. And Alice is very scary. <laughs> yes. She's very psychotic. She's also a big bad for Batwoman in the comic books. She is Alice in Wonderland themed from top to bottom. Yep. She mostly just quotes Lewis Carroll and Alice books. 
Um, that's much kind constantly. Of, it's kind of her thing. I don't know if if you notice like her her goons or whatever. One's a Chesh- wearing a Cheshire cat mask. One was wearing the white rabbit mask. Mm-hmm. Like the, even down to like her cronies, like they're all themed for Alice in Wonderland as well. I wonder how they get away with that legally. I don't know. I don't know what the copyright thing is or like, I mean, it's, of course, it's an old story. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of licensing. I mean, Disney did a movie, so I'm sure they have some kind of licensing stuff to it. Yeah, true. They Disneyed it up. Like, it's not the original. That's kind of darker, the Lewis Carroll version. True. But Yeah. And this is just like a a fun fact. So the member of the Crow security team that's a traitor is named Doxon. And Lewis Carroll was actually a pseudonym. The author's name was really Charles Doxon, spelled exactly the same as the security member who is like Alice's boyfriend. I don't know. Huh. I just thought that was a fun fact. That is a fun fact. It's a very fun fact. But... It turns out that there's a lot more to Alice than what we initially thought. There is. Basically, at the beginning of the episode, the the crows and I guess it's Catherine, Kate's stepmom, Mm -hmm. are like holding a ceremony to officially uh, rid Gotham City of the Batman. Because the Batman, who's Bruce Wayne, who we have not talked about, but I mean... That's who he is. <laughs> right. Uh, he's Kate's cousin. He disappeared. He's been gone for three years, I guess, so they're officially turning off the bat signal. And when that happens, Alice takes over the uh, feed and um, has kidnapped Sophie and basically is scary and evil. And then when Kate comes back to save Sophie, she kidnaps Kate. And has a big speech with her that means more later. Um, yep. And basically says, like, your dad's not going to come save you because he loves Sophie as his daughter. He doesn't love you. You're not important. And then she hits her over the face with a cricket bat. <laughs> um, and that's basically it until the end when uh, Kate, as Batwoman, comes back and saves Sophie from Alice, who is about to drop her off a building. Yep. Um, And and does. Does drop her off a building, and then Kate leaps off said building as Batwoman and saves her with her bat hooks. (laughs) And then puts her thumb in her mouth. (laughs) And then puts her thumb in her mouth like a weirdo. And then goes back for Alice. Yes, who is gone, except for the knife. Which she pockets, I guess, to check out later. Yes. And then, later, when Kate is thinking about Alice, she realizes, Shelly, I will let you move forward with this one. Alice is actually Kate's twin sister, Beth. And we haven't, we haven't got to see, like, what happened or how... Beth got to this state in the TV show. In the comic books, it was kind of what I was saying before, that she was kidnapped by a terrorist group, and they kept her, and she grew up, and I think they actually sold her to the religion of crime, which is like a gang. And she's like borders between sane and insane. But I think she's mostly just psychotic. She actually kills, like, members of that group who fail her, like, question her authority or her abilities or whatever. So I'm I'm curious to see. I have a feeling that that orphanage that they were at, Burnside, I think it was, mm-hmm. um, might play into. She said that they played the Ouija board there when they were kids. Um, yeah. But I don't know what kind of life Beth had leading up to the, this point of, of this Alice. But I'm very interested to see how they play it out. And I was really glad that they kept that storyline. 
Yeah, and I'm also really glad that um, it's it's clear at the end that Kate put it together. She knows. So it's not going to be like a long, drawn out, we know that Beth is, or we know that Alice is Beth. Kate doesn't know situation. Like, Kate knows now, mm-hmm. um, which is good. But yeah, it's going to, now that I know that background from the comics about everything that happened to her, it's going to be really interesting to see what they make happen in the show because that's not at all (laughs) the same situation um so i don't know if someone like rescued her out of the water sort of like what they did with arrow when oliver and sarah got you know swept into different places once the boat capsized um right and so different things happened to them so i don't i don't know if someone's going to have like taken her in um i mean presumably someone did but they were also like they weren't little little kids no, I'd say they were, like, 12-ish. Yeah, right? they were, like, adolescent. Which, I guess, just to me means that, like, they must have been really bad to, like, totally change her. But also, I don't know anything about child psychology, so I could be very wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not... I don't know anything about that either. <laughs> I'm not your person. But I... <laughs> yep, neither am I. Um, so, yeah, that'll be interesting, because now we're in a place where... Kate knows, but Beth doesn't know that Kate knows, and I bet that'll be revealed sooner rather than later. She'll try to get to her, but it won't work. Yeah, I mean, Kate kind of seems like a no-nonsense person. Yeah. So I could totally see her just rolling up on her and being like, what the fuck? Why are you like this? (laughs) Um, Dude, what? (laughs) It might be scripted better than that, but it'll be something similar. No, I really hope she says, why are you like this? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> but obviously Alice or Beth knows who Kate is. She seems to have a lot of contempt for her father. So yeah. I feel like there's history there. Like same I kind do. of deal maybe. Like he knows she's alive and that's why they couldn't find her body. Yeah, I, I bet he knows. Now that you said that he knew in the comics and Beth is clearly angry at him. I bet he knew. Or he made some kind of deal and he made it happen, which I hope didn't happen because I kind of want to like him. <laughs> so you mean like his daughter could stay alive, but they have to keep her and then they do whatever they right, want. Right, like with if her he was being thing. controlled, like, geez, I'm making a lot of Arrow references that I don't usually make. And I don't know why I know so much about Arrow when I stopped watching it a few years ago. But <laughs> oh, God, what's his name? Captain Lance. I can't think of his first name. Um, Quentin Lance. Quentin. He works for Damien Dark for a while to protect the city and protect his kids and stuff like that. So I just wonder if it's, you know, maybe something like that. Yeah, it could be. But either way, something really bad happened to Beth. Yes, clearly. Aside from being in a car when it fell over off a bridge and into a river below. Yeah, that that'll do some damage on its own. <laughs> yeah. Especially because there's no reason to believe that their mom is alive. And it wasn't like a short drop either. Like that was a long No, that was a big drop. old bridge. Yeah. And they both knew that Batman tried to save them. I don't think we talked about that. Batman launched two hooks or shot two hooks at the car and thought that he saved them and then he went off to go save the school bus. And the hooks failed, and that's why um, Beth, allegedly, and the mom died. And I think they saw Batman there, and they they sort of blamed him for not saving him. So I wonder if part of Beth's thing is hating the hero because the hero didn't save them, even though uh, he thought he did. Was it the trunk? Like, the metal that the trunk was made of? Was that the problem? Yeah, but... it was like the trunk ripped off of the car, and that's where the hooks were, or something like that. And it sounds like that haunted Bruce, like, forever. Like, it's, he never got over that. Yeah, that's very true. That's, yeah, that's what Luke said. So there's that. So I wonder if they, whoever took Beth afterwards, convinced her that Batman was bad. And I, when, I was just thinking, like, when she called Jacob, Beth did, about the bomb being in the back of that vehicle the crow's vehicle Mm -hmm. um he seemed very familiar with her when he talked to her 
He did. It didn't seem like surprising to him that he was hearing from her. I would bet that he knows who she is. Yeah, I feel like in the like comic books, he recognized her right away. That yeah. even though she was an adult, he like knew right away who she was. Well, I think it's more likely that he would be able to recognize his daughter than her sister, who was also a kid. Cause, I mean, well, first of all, like, I mean, she, <laughs> she's got a whole makeup thing and a whole bleached hair thing going on. Yeah. Um, so, like, she'd be pretty unrecognizable regardless. But for a kid to really remember exactly what she looked like and to be able to project what she would look like, <laughs> I think it's totally reasonable that Kate wouldn't know that it was her right off the bat. And I think it's probably reasonable that Jacob wouldn't either, but I think he probably does know. Yeah, I think so too. I like that they led with that. Yeah. I like that we didn't have to wait the whole season to figure that out. Because there are so many other shows where it takes so long. Like a big cliffhanger. Yeah. And then like leave the cliffhanger at the end of the season. So that we have to wait for season two to see how it's resolved. Yeah. I was trying to think of another one. And I don't know what's wrong with me tonight, but it's Arrow again. Right. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't, I got nothing for you. But um, I'm just thinking <laughs> about how long it took for them to tell us that uh, Malcolm Merlin was Thea's dad. Yeah. That's the... That's the closest situation I can think of is where, like, a familiar thing was concealed and that, therefore, Tommy Merlin was Thea's brother. Um, but, yeah, I, I like that they led with that. I like that uh, Kate knows now and that none of that is going to be a long time. Like, dramatic irony bothers me. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's just, like, drama for the sake of creating drama. Yeah. And maybe it's because we just... Uh, <laughs> It's just we we just recorded our Supergirl episode, which has been full of dramatic irony for the last three years. Yeah. Um. So maybe we're over it, but I'm glad Way. that it's all out now. Yeah, me too. In uh, well, in both, but specifically, what I mean is, I'm glad in Batwoman that that's not part that's gonna get drawn out. I think the uh, Kate being Batwoman thing is gonna be drawn out with Sophie for a while. You think so? I think so. Well, well, I, I don't guess, want it to be true. Yeah, I guess I was going to say, why wouldn't she trust her? But I mean, I guess with like their relationship is different than what Kate anticipated. Right. Um, I think she thought she was going to save her and they were going to be together. Right. And that's not the case. No, obviously. She saved her and Kate, uh, Sophie's married. Um, so she might not tell her for a while. I mean, I even like. In the Flash, it took like two and a half seasons or something crazy like that. So they might, they might conceivably draw it out for a long time. Yeah, like my in my mind, like I wondered if like because Batwoman saved Sophie and that whole intimate scene that they had, like is she gonna like fall in love with Batwoman and not realize it's Kate? You know what I mean? I'm here for that. So, I, I'm, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what direction they go with it. I don't feel like that Sophie is a one-off at all. No, I think she also, I think that actress was established in another CW TV show. You know how the CW loves to just bounce their actors back and forth? Yes. Um, Why not? Right. Um, so, I, I think because of that, that... um. I think she's in it for at least a little bit of a long haul. I hope it's the long haul. Um, I like her a lot. So I don't I don't think it's going to be a one-off. I think I haven't checked to see if she's like a regular or what. And I mean, for the first episode, I think this was perfect. I think they did it perfectly for how I know Batwoman from the comics. Uh, she's kind of standoffish, similar to Batman and or Bruce Wayne. And I think it's, like, the relationships are always kind of strained because of that, like, the personal relationships, um, because of their personalities. So I'm very 
excited like how they've handled this and they've kind of stayed true to that i'm really glad that they started out with the main baddie as alice i feel yeah. like they just did everything right and just like because we were talking about this last show and i don't know why like it just hit me so my endorsement that i'm going to do later is for a comic book and it's a it's a batwoman comic book and it's written by Greg Rucka, and Greg Rucka is currently writing Stumptown. Oh, <laughs> we should have talked about this before. We could have done this. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I don't know why. Like, I didn't think of it, but yeah. So he's a really good writer, and you should listen to our Pot Off Course podcast <laughs> to hear Aaron's endorsement for Stumptown because it looks like a really good show. Stumptown, I'll say it real quick. Stumptown is really cool. It's based off a comic book series, obviously. It stars Colby Smulders, who's awesome. It's dope. So, yeah. Watch it if you haven't. Yep. There's one more character I wanted to touch on that's a very minor, minor character. You don't even see them. But the news personality, Vesper Fairchild, is voiced by Rachel Maddow. Yeah. And I fucking love Rachel Maddow. So I was so pumped to see this. And she's going to be part of my endorsement later for that comic book that I was talking about. So I'm interested to see how that works. She's She's been down with Batwoman for a long time. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um. So I wonder, is her... I didn't really read that much into, like... Her guest starring other than I know she's going to be multiple episodes. So I wonder if she's just the voice or if she's actually going to show up. I think she's just the voice of Vesper Fairchild. I'll be surprised if she does show up. I know she has like some social anxieties and such. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's really like her gig. I mean, she does her show, but that's like a, her talking right. to a camera or like one other person. I don't know if she'll. I don't really think acting is her. No, I don't think so thing. either. That's but... cool though. The voice. The voice is cool. Yeah. And you can look up Vesper Vesper Fairchild. She was, like, I think she dated Bruce Wayne for a hot minute. And there's all kinds of background info for her. But Supergirl briefly mentions a source named Vesper at some point. I can't think of exactly what the situation is. I wonder if that was just an Easter egg. Maybe. I don't remember that at all. I should. Where do you remember, like, in what context or what it was, like, around? I mean, it was definitely something to do with Catco. I think it was James. Um, I can't remember. Um, I'll figure it out, though, and we'll try to <laughs> put in a second to say what I'm thinking about at next time. Um, okay. It definitely has something to do with James. Yeah, I'd be interested, because I didn't catch that at all, so I'd be interested to see what it is. There's also a large chance that I'm wrong. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, if you want, you can cut that out, and we can talk about it next time if I'm right. And I think that's it. Like, that's... I I think that's everything. There's not too much to talk about right now. She didn't do much in Elseworlds. Um, She was only in the aerial part of Elseworlds. Just the episode in the middle. Basically, she said she was starting a real estate firm out of Wayne Enterprises, which I don't really even, they didn't, I don't think they kept that for Batwoman. Or they haven't gotten to it yet, like maybe she's building. That's true, because that, that was the future, and Batwoman is now in at least the distant past. Great. Um, so maybe they're starting it now, because I guess Jacob offered her to be a crow, and I it, they implied that she said no. So maybe she's going to start a real estate firm, <laughs> which I guess is what you do if you don't get into private security. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's what my logical next move would have been. Right. Um, but that's about <laughs> it. She didn't do much else in Elseworlds. Nothing of consequence to the show. So except for that she and Kara are cute friends, and I hope they stay cute friends in uh, Crisis. Yeah, me too. I'm excited for her to meet Alex. Yeah, I feel like they would, like, their personalities are more in line. Like, she and Kara are very, very, very opposite. 
each mm-hmm. other as far as personalities go. So yeah, I think I think she and Alex will get along, um, which will be fun. Or maybe it'll just have a fun uh, side shot of them sitting in silence. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they meet. I mean, there's a, uh, I don't know, a billion characters in Crisis, so they might not, but I hope they do. Me too. So that was the first episode of Batwoman, Sunday night, CW, 8 p.m. Yeah, about that. I feel like Supergirl is an 8 p.m. show and Batwoman is a 9 p.m. show. I felt the same way. Like, I was really surprised. I mean... There's, like, some stuff on Supergirl, but, like, like there was, like, knobs and dudes' chests and shit, like, on Batwoman, like, right away. Like, dead people on camera. And that's not something you typically see on Supergirl. Yeah, and I, I don't know if they did it because they wanted to catch the people that were around anyway to watch Supergirl. But, I mean, it would make more sense to me for Supergirl to be a lead-in and then people just stick around for Batwoman. Um, that's what I thought too, but I don't, I don't know. We don't make the rules. Yeah. I don't know how TV works. Yeah. Neither do I. Um, (laughs) but yeah, I mean, Batwoman is definitely darker, so I don't know why it's on at eight, but it is. And Supergirl's on at nine. Darker and a lot more violent. Like there is a lot of violent shit going on. Yeah. How was that for you? Uh, adult and (laughs) like. People putting dirty thumbs in other people's mouths without yeah. consent. So, I mean, there's just a lot to take in in Batwoman compared to Supergirl, which is way more chill than that. Yeah, it is a quite a different change of pace going from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., which is weird, but whatever. Yeah. As soon as I saw that, I was like, why in the fuck did they do that? Like, I already know, like, this is going to be like a like just Gotham itself is just gritty and rough. right. Even if all you know is Batman, you know is darker than Supergirl. <laughs> right. Like if they just do like a pan shot of like the streets of Gotham, and like you contrast that to like everybody with their lattes at noon, and it's like come on, like what the <laughs> yeah. hell? Clearly, one of those is for earlier, but I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, I'm glad it's there, and I'm definitely watching. I don't care where they put it, I'll be there. Yeah, I am, uh, I'm here for it. I'm excited. I'm mad that people are mad about it for no reason. I think most of the people mad about it are just sexist, so. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited about it. I was not really surprised, uh, maybe a little bit pleasantly surprised by the premiere, but mostly I just really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was... Like, I can't wait to see what happens next episode. And I don't even feel like they ended it on much of a cliffhanger because they ended it where, like, Kate, like, already figured out who Mm -hmm. Alice was. But I still, like, am excited to see, like, what she does with that information. Yeah, I'm excited. It's going to be good. So on our other show, we would typically have maybe listener feedback here. You can find us on Twitter at Red Herring Pod, R-E-D-H-A-I-R-I-N-G-P-O-D. And you can email us at redherring at gmail.com. So send in some listener feedback, what you think of that week's episode or with the show in general. Uh, and we will read and discuss your tweet or email on our next podcast. And we also do endorsements of just something doesn't have to necessarily be related to Batwoman, but it can be, but it's just like something cool that we're into that week. My endorsement this week is a Batwoman trade paperback and it's an older one. It's called Elegy. But it has the first appearance of Alice or Beth. It compiles Detective Comics 854 to 860. And it's kind of like a really good staple for Batwoman comics. Uh, It's written by Greg Rucka, who also wrote Stumptown. And 
It's from two. This trade paperback is from 2010. The introduction of the comic is written by Rachel Maddow, who is now Vesper Fairchild. So Rachel Maddow has been down with that woman for a really long time. That makes me happy. Yeah. March 2010 is when she wrote that introduction. And the comic is really good and really interesting and something I really wouldn't read at night before bed. I mean, some people can handle it. I am not one of those people. Some people can handle, like, creepy stuff and be okay with it. Not me. So you've been forewarned that it is definitely worth checking out, especially if you're really into the show. It'll be, like, a good way to get, like, a history on on all the characters, even if it's not the direction they necessarily take in the show. Like, I think it's just really interesting to see the contrast and, like, know more about each character. Cool. Um, mine is not related to superheroes in the slightest. Mine is for the self-titled album from the band, uh, The High Women. It's been out for maybe two months now. It is a country album, um, which is not normally my thing, but The High Women are sort of a supergroup um, between Brandi Carlisle, Amanda Shires, Natalie Hemby, and Marin Morris, who are all Americana country stars in their own right. And it all came to be because Amanda Shires was once on tour and on the road listening to a country music station for like three hours and only heard one woman get played. And so decided that something needed to change in country music. So they got everyone together and they made this album and it's it's amazing. They sound great together. It adds a like a depth and a thoughtfulness to country music that is not currently present on the charts when a lot of country music is about trucks. So it's really, really good. And um, one of the songs on the album is called If She Ever Leaves Me. And it is uh, it's Brandi Carlisle singing about being in love with a woman, which is uh, revolutionary for country music, especially for an album that's been number one on the country music charts for a little while. (laughs) Um, That's true. So it's really cool. It's really good. And it's not strictly for country music fans. It's definitely more of a folky Americana vibe. So there's that. But I think it's really awesome that people are trying to change the landscape of music industries that have historically been dominated by men and very hard to budge. So I'm really excited about it. So if you're into it, check it out. It's on Spotify and probably everything else. High Women? Is that- yes, High Women. It's a play on... Um, the Highway Men, which was a super group of country stars like Johnny Cash and other people that I can't think of right now from like a couple decades ago. So this is their version of that. Awesome. I heard a High Women cover. They did the chain. Yes. Is and it good? A, oh my God, it's fucking amazing. Yeah. So their backing band is Jason Isbell, who is uh, like an amazing musician in his own right and he's married to amanda shires and tim and phil hanseroth who are brandy carlisle's backing band all the time and so they're all like they're all in a collaborative movement together to change the landscape of the music that they all make so which i note because the playing in that cover of the chain is really really good and that's those three guys so. Yeah, it's one of the best covers i've ever heard of fleetwood mac and i'm a huge fleetwood mac fan and Fleetwood Mac is my favorite band of all time. Really? Uh huh. Look at us learning stuff about <laughs> each other, like we've never talked before. Shelly <laughs> um, and I met yesterday, which is weird because we've been recording a podcast together for a year. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like it's it's probably the best cover of a Fleetwood Mac song I've ever heard because I like Fleetwood Mac that much. I don't care for the covers. Mm-hmm. This was amazing. And if anybody has Sirius XM, they frequently play it on the Spectrum channel. So check it out. Yeah, the four-part harmonies on that cover are insane. Yeah. Um, yeah, so check them out. They make me want to cry every day. Great endorsement. Thanks. Awesome. Please rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please reach out to us and share your thoughts with us. You can email us at redherringpod at gmail.com. And you can also leave us comments on Twitter at redherringpod. 
And aside from at Red Herring Pod on Twitter, you can find us individually. I'm at Shop23 on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Ernie Greenbean on Twitter and Instagram. And if you like what we have to say here and you also watch Supergirl, we also do a Supergirl podcast called Pod Off Course. And you can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. And the same kind of applies for that as far as you can email us at podoffcourse at gmail.com. And then we're on Twitter at Pod Off Course. So check us out if you're into that. Thank you so much for listening to our inaugural episode of Red Herring, a Batwoman podcast. I hope you like it, and I hope you'll tune in next time. See ya. Bye. I'm just going to start into it. Okay. You can reach us on Twitter at Red Herring Pod. That's H A I R I N G, Red Herring Pod at gmail.com. Wait, sorry. Damn it. <laughs> you have to edit all this out. It's too late for the shit, Aaron. The outtakes. <laughs> Motherfucker. All right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Ooh, buddy. <laughs> I tell I should just like end the show, like me, just like on a swearing tirade. <laughs>